my name is Alicia. I'm currently a graduate student at Stanford University, although soon to be an ex-graduate student. So I just defended my thesis two weeks ago today. Um, the work I'll be talking to <laughs> yeah, the work I'll be talking to you today about today, though, is not from my graduate work, which uh, focuses on building tools for analyzing functional genomics. Data here, I'll be talking about work I did um, at Genentech, um, first starting out as a summer intern last summer, and then that I've sort of continued on um, part-time afterwards. So before I sort of get into heat maps and how we can make complex interactive heat maps, I want to give some motivation from the, why we sort of started embarking on this project. So Steve, during the first talk today, um, gave a really great introduction to genomics and about how the sort of sequencing revolution is, is really creating a lot of opportunities in biology. I want to give a brief introduction to another kind of genomic data that you might not have thought about as much, which is uh, functional genomics, where you're using sequencing as a measuring tool. So the idea here is that, you know, if you have particular regions of the genome and they have different properties, for example, maybe they're bound by a particular protein, if you can have some process for specifically isolating out those pieces of DNA that have that property and then getting rid of all the other DNA, if you sequence the DNA you've isolated and map it back to the genome and see where your reads are lining up, you'll get a buildup of signal. And that indicates that this was a region of DNA that was probably had that property that you were looking for. So this is a way to get a genome-wide uh, measurement of properties of DNA. Um, now, in terms of how we can visualize this kind of data, um, oftentimes a, a visualization is to look at a, a signal track at a particular locus. So we might be looking at here just like a small region of the genome, and we can look at what genes are in this region, and also sort of just pile up the signal based off of how many reads mapped at each location. So you might see some nice peaks at some regions, and you can potentially show uh, a number of, sorry, a number of different um, uh, assays and samples in this kind of view. The problem with this kind of view is it doesn't scale very well. Um, here we're just looking at one region of the genome, and the genome is really big. The, you know, in a human genome we have three billion bases. Um, we can't, you know, see that all at once in this kind of view. And so while this is great um, for sort of looking at a particular region, uh, it's not necessarily good to get a more comprehensive view of what's going on. And that's why a lot of genome scientists like to use heat maps. And in particular, they like to sort of really build up uh, complex uh, heat maps that involve a lot of different components. So here's just an example of what I mean by a complex heat map. So here in this uh, visualization, we're showing along each row a different gene. And then we're showing for multiple different samples, for one assay, the measurement uh, for that particular gene. And here we're looking at a particular property of the gene, again, not looking at what exactly the DNA sequence is, but here looking at a sort of a, a type of modification of the DNA. We can then potentially link that to another uh, measurement that we've made for that same gene. Um, in this case, the actual expression level, so how, act, how much of that uh, gene is actually getting produced um, in each sample. We can add these kinds of annotations to, to sort of help better understand what's going on. For example, some group of samples was actually um, a control group of samples, while another group were tumors. And so this bar at the top can indicate that. We can connect it to all sorts of other types of information about the gene. Um, for example, if we have some, any kind of annotation, we, we can imagine, we, we, can, we can potentially add on here um, to complement it to get a sense of, okay, we see this pattern that maybe um, all of these genes um, uh, have sort of less methylation in the tumor than the control. Maybe that's connected with some kind of annotation. And so through this kind of visualization, we could actually see that. So this is pretty great for like integrating a lot of different data together. Um, it's also limiting in some ways because when, you know, you might show this to um, your collaborator or uh, pretty much anybody that might be interested and they might start to ask questions about, okay, so I see these regions, these genes that seem to be doing this in the tumor and the control. Well, what are these actual genes? You can't, because you're packing in so much information into this display, you've lost actually the information of 
what gene is where. You're also missing some information about the local genomic context. Context. So when you have a particular gene, um, what what is its neighboring genes doing? You, you, you've you've t sort of, because you've done this kind of abstraction, you're you're sort of now missing out on some of that information. Um, and so one way to sort of add information back into these heat maps to make them better for explore, exploration is to add interactivity. So there's a number of different uh, types of interactivity that you might want to see. Um, one is just a uh, tooltip on its own can be extremely useful because in terms of just that question of what gene is represented in this part of the heat map, you can potentially show that in, in the tooltip so that when the user actually hovers over the heat map, they'll see, oh, this is the bag three gene and uh, you know, this is what sample I'm showing. It's also actually pretty useful to even just be able to see the value that's represented by that cell. Um, as you might have, um, as you're probably well aware, color isn't really the best sort of encoder of information. It can be hard to perceive what exact values uh, are encoded by uh, different points along a color scale. So it can actually be really helpful when you're trying to really sort of explore a heat map and understand what the different colors mean to be able to hover over and see the exact value. Zooming can also be really helpful just because, you know, you, uh, uh, any given row of this heat map might be pretty small and if your eyes aren't very good, it can be hard to figure out what's, what's going on and so you can get a closer up look. Um, and then additionally, in sort of more higher order sort of interactivity is that you can potentially add in sort of click or brush events that enable you to move to a different view of the data. And so we wanted to be able to um, add this interactivity to these complex heat maps. And we wanted to be able to do this in R. And the reason for doing this um, in R is that uh, there's a ton of bioinformatics uh, tools in R that make it really easy to read in these different kinds of data and do some initial pre-processing. And so we wanted to be able to build upon that. We also wanted to make sure that this was some, these sort of heat maps were something that were pretty easy to generate. Um, we don't necessarily want people to have to then move from R to create something very custom in, in D3 or some other uh, JavaScript sort of framework be, because ultimately our goal is to create these as tools for exploration. And so the sort of quicker we can make these kinds of heat maps, uh, the better. So in R, there's already a lot of great packages for making various kinds of heat maps. In particular, there's a number of packages for making pretty simple interactive heat maps. Um, so just the Plotly package on its own has some functionality for heat maps. There's also the heat maply package, which is built on top of Plotly. Um, and I think this is an example from that package. And then there's the D3 heat map, which is built on, off of D3, uh, comes from our studio and also enables to make, you to make this kind of uh, heat map. There's also a really great R package for making these complex heat maps in a static way. In particular, the aptly named complex heat map package um, and its sort of companion package, enriched heat map, which is uh, targeted towards genomics. And so this heat map that I'm showing here is actually one um, from, from those packages. So where, what I came in and did was created a package called iHeatMapper, which makes complex interactive heat maps in R. It leverages the Plotly uh, JS library and also the Plotly R packages um, for doing this, so it can all be done in R, and it sort of builds up a modular framework for making these uh, heat maps. So a little bit about this modular framework. The idea is that when these, you have these complex heat maps, that there's usually a number of basic building parts and that we can um, make functions for making each of these different components. There's also the idea of how we can then um, assemble all these components into this uh, complex graphic. And the idea is that you can build up around one of these um, sort of main heat maps. So you start with just a regular uh, heat map without any of these additional source subplots. Then you can add stuff on the top or the left or again on the top or again on the left or on the bottom or the right. And then potentially you can then want to add in another sort of primary heat map that's showing um, data maybe from another assay. Um, and then on top of that one, again, you can add stuff continually onto you know, the sides, the top, or the bottom, and sort of build up iteratively this rather uh, complex graphic. So now I just want to show what this actually looks like in terms of um, doing this in R and, and working with real data. Oh, well, actually, first, sorry. I wanted to, another sort of feature of these complex heat maps is that there's some shared information between things that are aligned. So in particular, 
for, along this main uh, horizontal axis, these will share the same y-axis, which means that if you zoom in on any particular one, it'll zoom in um, synchronously for all the other ones. And furthermore, that there's some row order that's embedded in the structure. So oftentimes with a heat map, you might want to, you know, the, these rows will be a categorical variable, and you might want to play around with different ways of ordering that data. And with this structure, that sort of row ordering is considered a common feature across these. So you can just add on a particular row order, and it will be propagated to all these different subcomponents. And the same is true for vertically aligned plots, where um, all of these will share now the same x-axis, will have linked zooming, and uh, share the same column order within any of these sort of vertical stacks. So now, uh, getting to what it actually looks like, um, in terms of how you would initialize this, it's just a simple function for creating one of these uh, basic heat maps. Although I'll note that this basic heat map here created just using uh, a function called main heat map will already have uh, those interactivity. And here I'm just showing, um, in terms of what data I'm, I'm displaying, is correlation um, for some patients in terms of uh, the concentration of a drug over time. So this is just a basic correlation heat map. And uh, here you can see sort of if you moused over things, you could actually see um, what some additional information as the particular values of the correlation. So these are actually all highly correlated. Um, and you could also see sort of which patient is represented uh, by each um, block. You can then sort of take that initial object that's created and pass it on to subsequent functions to add on additional components. So here we're adding on the dendrograms um, through these functions add call clustering and add row clustering. These will not only add on these dendrograms, but they'll also additionally sort of now encode that row and column order information into that object so that when you add additional things um, onto this heat map, um, those row and, and, and column orders will end up getting propagated to every single component that is aligned along either the horizontal or vertical um, axis. So then, you know, you can then continue to add on things. And here, um, if you're not familiar with what this sort of um, percent uh, uh, carrot, whatever percent uh, symbol is, this is just the pipe operator in R that has become very popular. It's a nice way for chaining together uh, a lot of functions. We can then add on additional things like annotations here on the right. Just pass on a data frame of, of patient information. So here in the far right, I'm showing some groups. Maybe the patients fall into two groups. In terms of thinking about, like, uh, here I actually just made up these groups, but in thinking about real data, you might think of, like, male or female or that kind of um, grouping that you'd want to show just to see if there's any pattern um, along your correlation. Another thing, sorry, I'm a little, uh, pressing the button a little too anxiously, um, is that you know, when you have correlation, you lose some information in terms of the dynamic range of the data. You can have two vectors that are highly correlated, but they actually have very different variants or maybe very different magnitudes. And so you can actually add on some of that information, perhaps showing like the maximum uh, drug concentration and the minimum drug concentration for each patient. That's uh, just another example of how you, the, this sort of uh, complex layering of multiple subplots can add information to these visualizations. And we can add on a potentially an additional main heat map. So here, as I was saying, this is correlation for um, uh, drug doses in various patients. And so you can actually potentially want to actually show the raw data here alongside it, where again, it's sort of uh, the, the rows or the rows are aligned here. So the patient that's represented by this top row, it'll also be represented by that top row um, in this heat map. Then there's additional stuff like maybe a summary of that uh, data along the top or um, some additional labels. And all of these things are getting added on sort of iteratively through the call to a new function. And so, so then just to, sh to sort of highlight in terms of the zooming, if you t pick a particular region and you zoom in, you'll notice that all of the, the, the sort of things that are aligned horizontally will zoom in uh, together. So putting this all together, all the code that created this plot, it's, it's actually sort of calling a, a number of different functions because each of these pieces is getting added one at a time. Now, this enables a high degree of flexibility because you can change the order in which you add things, and you can um, really make up a very customized heat map. 
It might also seem tedious to have to call 10 different functions, though. The idea is, though, that this modular framework can be a building block for developers to build more customized functions. So even within just this iHeatMapper package, we also included another function called iHeatMap, which just wraps together some of these individual functions to create a sort of some more fairly standard heat maps. So this same visualization can also be made um, using some alternate code with far fewer function calls, um, where we, we just pass um, some options to those functions. Now this doesn't actually seem necessarily like that much less code, because this iHeatMap function is still pretty generic, because it's still trying to be pretty flexible. But if you have a particular heat map you want to make over and over again, you can actually uh, maybe potentially build something um, uh, much more specific, and so that you, you don't necessarily have to go each time through all these different steps. And I'm actually going to highlight that um, in, the, in the next section of the talk, um, where I'm going to sort of jump to the specific focus on genomics data. So the basic idea here is that these modules in genomics, there's certain standard kinds of heat maps that you often want to make, that we can actually make functions that build on these modular building blocks uh, to create some of these standard visualizations. Um, so one of these standard types of visualizations is, is uh, what's called a coverage heat map, where you just show the signal around certain landmarks in the genome. Um, I'm also going to show at the end some tools for integrating those kinds of heat maps with other views using Shiny. So now, just getting back to this idea of functional genomics, I'm going to focus on one particular kind of assay. So I showed this earlier, which is just a schematic of a particular technique called ChIP-seq, where you're measuring protein binding genome-wide. So again, just as a reminder, you, might, uh, you, might, you isolate just the pieces of DNA that were bound to the protein, uh, sequence them, map them back to the genome, and you get some signal uh, buildup that indicates uh, that the protein was bound at a particular region. And so, when you visualize, when you want to sort of visualize this across many regions of the genome, what you might do is identify sort of the peaks in the signal, and then aggregate, get, look at what the signal around that peak looks like. And this is often called sort of a coverage heat map. So here we have sort of the position relative to these peaks, and we're showing what the signal around them looks like. And you can see that it, you know, it looks like a peak, which is kind of circular in a way because that's what we identified in, but what we might look, be interested in seeing is sort of what the particular shape at each of these regions are. There is no reason a priori to expect that the shape will be exactly the same at each of the regions, but here for this uh, particular case, um, it is actually a pretty uniform shape at all of these regions. And what here, in terms of the code that created this, it's just a simple function called here coverage heat map, which makes this taking in a matrix of these values and makes this actually pretty complicated um, plot. So just walking through a few of the additional features of this plot, um, we also show here sort of the aggregate, so you can see sort of in addition to what the shape is at each of these different regions, what it is on average. Um, with this data, to, to sort of really be able to focus on the shape, we've done some kind of um, normalization per row to make the scales more comparable. Doing that, though, we've lost some information about the magnitude of the signal. So again, sort of similar to what I was showing with uh, the correlation heat map, you might be able to add things like magnitude back into data where, you, where you've sort of stripped it away, is we can actually show sort of the average signal before we normalize it away. So you're not, you know, you're still being able to really focus on the shape by having normalized out the di differences in the absolute magnitude of the signal, but you can also, um, still see the magnitude in this uh, annotation here. Now here I'm showing just the binding for one particular protein. So this is uh, the uh, protein uh, CCCF along the genome. What we might want to do is though uh, do this for a number of different proteins. And so here we can actually start to look at is the binding of different proteins along the genome, does it tend to happen at the same spots? So we start off with those same peak regions we identified from the CTCF chip seek. We aggregate across all of those and see what it looks like, but then we can also pair that with uh, the data for a couple other proteins. And so then we can, I see that for this ZNF143 protein, at least some of the binding sites here seem to show um, a similar uh, pattern for this other protein, but it seems like it's not consistent for all of them, that there's maybe some co-localization, but, but not everywhere. And you can also, sort of the, the summary here helps highlight that. You can see that the sort of amplitude of the peak is, is smaller, but that there is still a, a peak at these regions. 
If you look at this um, third uh, protein, though, there, there's much smaller of a peak, and it seems like the, the, the signal is pretty random in these regions. And so this is um, a, a useful visualization for, for connecting um, the data from these three different um, proteins together. And again, in terms of the actual code to create this, we just have to initially make these matrices, and then to make this complex visualization, it's just one function call. So you know, in this actual function, we're sort of building on all these modular building blocks, but for the end user, when you just want to make this pretty standard visualization, um, it's just a very uh, simple uh, function call. And again, you're getting all of these interactive features where you can actually sort of hover over things and see what region of the genome does it actually correspond to, what's the actual value that's encoded there, and um, what's the actual position, and you can also do things like um, select a region and zoom in to get a more detailed um, look here. And when the zooming happens, it happens for all of the, the, the heat maps that are aligned, so you get that, so that all the rows are still aligned in the same way. Now finally, I want to talk about how you can further extend these heat maps um, with additional interactivity, in particular through click events. Um, so here we can leverage uh, the R Plotly package, which makes it easy to uh, integrate Plotly graphics into Sh Shiny, which is a framework for, for building um, web applications in R. Um, and what the, the R Plotly package has made easy is actually getting out the information from a click to be able to do some other action. Um, and so the kind of click event I'm going to be showing here is actually clicking on a row of the data and then getting a more detailed view of the data at that locus um, across the samples. So we start off with that same uh, heat map, sort of browsing about, we are interested in something, so we click on it. And then it, what comes up is actually, and I click again, and something else comes up of these sort of genome browser type view. Uh, this genome browser type view is also actually interactive, um, and so you can zoom in on things and get a good view of what's happening. And you can, you know, continue to do that to really get a sense of, you know, here we're just showing in those heat maps 2,000 base pairs. But we might want to get a better sense of, if we see some interesting row, what's going on around there? Are there other peaks around there? What genes are present? And so linking um, that kind of data through, through a click really enables that additional level of exploration. Now these sort of genome tracks I'm showing here were actually also created using Plotly. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but the library is, is very uh, flexible for creating a, a wide variety of, of different visualizations. So I hope I have uh, at this point convinced you a little bit that interactivity can help uh, improve the exploratory potential of heat maps. Um, again, the tool tips, zooming and clicking, all enable you to get a really better feel for the data and potentially link what's happening in your data to other um, views. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for sort of extending upon this uh, framework that potentially you might want to link brush events to different kinds of views as well. Um, the iHeatMapper package is uh, currently available on GitHub and hopefully at some point the additional tools uh, specific for genomics heat maps will also be available there. Um, and finally, I just want to thank uh, all the people that helped make this work possible. Um, as I mentioned, all this work uh, was done uh, at Genentech, and I want to thank uh, my manager, Sarah, who really helped guide this work, and also Justin Fingal, who was another intern at the same time as I, and did a lot of that work towards creating that interactive genome browser track type view, um, which we're also hoping um, to get out uh, soon. There's a lot of other people at Genentech that also helped out um, in terms of giving feedback on the project at various uh, time points. The project is also, the iHeatMapper package will also be submitted to ROpenSci. It's been really great having some external reviewers take a look and give feedback. And I'm still uh, working through uh, th some of their suggestions, but hopefully it might eventually get uh, accepted into their ecosystem and then also submitted to CRAN. And finally, just a shout out to Plotly. All of this work was built on top of the Plotly library. Um, it's been really uh, great to work with. Thanks.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'm not working on it in like a very focused way, but I mean, definitely along these kind of heat maps, you can have along that x axis being time. And so, in terms of how I showed it in these plots here, the x axis was always considered as a categorical variable. But you can also actually sort of um, specify that you want it to be treated as a continuous variable, so the, the columns don't necessarily need to be of a fixed width if the different time intervals aren't equal. Um, and so I think that can be a, a useful way of looking, um, you know, he, here where you have, um, I guess I'll show another example. You know, if you, if you look at, um, like one of the really famous visualization is, um, oh, sorry, um, the Wall Street Journal vaccine heat map, where they show for a bunch of different states across time um, the measles instance rate before and after vaccines were introduced. So, like with a heat mapper, we can like sort of recreate that and have sort of time along here. You can uh, really nicely see sort of the, the, the trend of a drop off in measles incidence after the vaccine is introduced, with a, that being encoded in this extra annotation heat map. And then the summary is really useful here because you can sort of see what the aggregate signal is. So, I don't know if that totally answers your question. We haven't really been thinking about specific tools um, for time series, but these tools are pretty uh, generalizable for that kind of data too. Question? Uh, do you have any comments on heat maps uh, where the number of data points is larger than the number of pixels? Yeah, um, where the number of data points is larger than the number of pixels. Um, so yeah, here we're, we're using um, yeah. I think that's a, that'd be like a definitely a very interesting avenue for like uh, future work. Um, for example, like when we're actually showing some of these um, uh, coverage heat maps here, there's some binning that's done like along this direction, just to, like reduce the the sort of size of um, the data along this axis, and it could be. Um, Useful as like a sort of a more advanced heat map representation is to actually show where the binning is done um, only when you're in, in the zoomed out view, while if you actually zoomed in, you'd get that more granular view. Um, just in terms of building something fairly simple on top of uh, the Plotly library, this was sort of the easiest way to go where the zooming just gives you like a, a blow up version of the same thing, but really in terms of thinking about the future, in terms of how to really um, drive these heat maps forward. I think that's uh, an excellent point, and I think really thinking about how to aggregate things um, at different levels, at different zoom levels, um, is, yeah, it was key. To